One of the delights of working and teaching at Boston College is uh, I have the pleasure of working with many fabulous colleagues. And um, my co-conspirator in workshops will be introducing our next speaker. But just to give you some context, just to show you how ecumenical we are here, both in Brighton and Newton, we have invited someone from across the river. <laughs> he had his visa checked, and he's come from the People's Republic of Cambridge. <laughs> and he's come from that other school. <laughs> That will remain nameless. <laughs> and yeah, I'd like to introduce Melinda Brown Donovan, the Assistant Director of the Continuing Education Program, who will introduce our speaker. Melinda. Thank you. And before we begin, I just wanted to give a few words of thanks as well. Um, all these students that greeted you as you came in. These are all graduate students from the School of Theology and Ministry. They are Joelle Miller, Eric Martin, Sarah Knudsen, Randy Oust, Brian Nemec, and Jody Dean. The, and none of them are here. So I'll, hear them. I'll let them know you appreciate them, as I do very much. I also want to thank Karen Kiefer, my colleague in the Church in the 21st Century Center, who is also here this morning um, helping with this day. And it's now my, my great honor. Thank you. It's now my great honor to introduce our presenter this afternoon. Robert C. Bourdon is the Thaddeus R. Beale Clinical Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and the founding director of the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program. Bob is a graduate of Harvard Law School, the school it's now being named, and a member of the bars of New York, New Jersey, and the District of Columbia. He teaches several courses at Harvard Law School, including the flagship negotiation workshop, as well as in the Harvard Negotiation Institute. In 2007, Bob received the Albert Sachs Paul Point Award for Teaching Excellence, Mentorship of Students, and General Contributions to the Life of the Law School. His research interests include the design and implementation of dispute resolution systems, the development of a problem-solving curriculum in law schools, and ethics of dispute resolution. Bob is currently writing a book with colleagues entitled Designing Systems and Creating Processes for the Effective Management of Conflict to be published in 2012. He has also authored articles in leading dispute resolution journals and is a frequent contributor to various print and broadcast media outlets, including the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, and BBC Radio. As a professional facilitator and conflict resolution consultant, Bob works with individual and corporate clients across a spectrum of industries. He specializes in assisting individuals and groups seeking to manage conflicts in highly sensitive, emotional, or difficult situations. His corporate clients have included Fidelity Investments, Nestle, Coca-Cola, Delta Airlines, and Microsoft. In addition, he has worked on projects with nonprofit institutions such as the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Massachusetts General Hospital, the U.S. Department of Justice, and the United Way. A very qualified person to now be speaking to us on understanding and managing difficult conversations. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Melinda, and thank you for inviting me and for being here today. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here. I was listening to all of those things that I, I guess, have done over the years and was thinking that uh, you may all be nervous because my most recent track record is not so great. In January, um, uh, students from my clinic uh, were at Harvard Law School went to do some work in Egypt, and about two days after they got back, 
is when the protest started. Uh, and about two, I guess now two and a half weeks ago with another colleague, I was in Damascus. Uh, and the last day we left is when the protest started. Uh, so may maybe, maybe the purpose of coming across the river is to, to bring strength to Boston College. I don't know. Uh, I hope not. I hope not. Um, um, no, seriously, it's, it's really an honor for me to be here. All of you uh, have so much more experience doing work in difficult conversations um, than certainly I do. Uh, and I hope today uh, simply to spend a bit of time uh, sharing with you a little bit more uh, of kind of how these conversations are often structured and maybe offer a few tips uh, on how to think about them. The, Information I'm sharing today, I uh, can take no credit for developing. It really comes from a book written by my colleagues called Difficult Conversations, um, How to Discuss What Matters Most. It's actually one of the, the three main texts that we use when we teach uh, negotiation at Harvard Law School. And it's probably the one that is most confusing to law students. They don't expect to get this material. Um, but it's also, I think, the, uh, the, they report back the book that is most useful and most powerful um, to them. So in terms of, by the way, you have these slides in your um, uh, folders if you want to follow along. So you do have them in your folders. So in terms of kind of decoding the structure of difficult conversations, I guess I want to start by giving you, a, is this a volume one that's OK for people? Yeah? OK. Um, by giving you uh, a definition of what I mean by difficult conversations, um, it's a very broad definition. It's really kind of any conversation that you dread. <laughs> uh, so something that makes you anxious, something that uh, uh, you want to avoid in some way, that provokes strong emotions. Um, what they are is really going to vary depending on who you are. So it could be talking to an aging parent about their will. Um, it could be uh, giving... Uh, a really negative job appraisal to an employee. Uh, it could be talking to a friend about uh, an addiction problem, um, uh, uh, firing someone, giving bad news. It's going to depend um, depending on kind of what you find to be really hard. Um, oftentimes, when we think about these difficult conversations, we end up in kind of a pattern of indecision because there's something bothering us in some way. Right? You're feeling badly. I should raise this with the person. It's not fair if I don't. Um, on the other hand, you think about it and you say, it's just going to go badly. That won't help. It'll make things worse. So you let it slide. Or maybe you've had the conversation before and it did go badly. But then something happens and you say, no, no, I really have to raise it. Uh, and you get stuck in this kind of indecision cycle. And one of the, one of the things that we've learned is often what makes uh, uh, kind of a, an indication that you might need to have a difficult conversation is when you're kind of saying one thing, like, you know, great idea, um, but you're actually thinking something else like, have you lost your mind, right? <laughs> and, um, and one of the real marks, one of the things that we've learned through our work um, in the uh, Harvard Negotiation Program over the past, for me, about 15 years, and for my colleagues, about 30 years, is that, uh, conversations tend to be more difficult um, the wider the gap between what people are actually saying and what people are actually thinking. So if this happy character, the yellow character, says, hi, how are you? And, and then the pink character here says, hi, how are you? Um, but um, once, if one is saying, you know, why is that not working? Um, one is saying, you know, I hate you. Oh, yeah, I hate you. This guy here is saying, I hate you, right? That's where kind of the problem is. Um, and so one kind of mark here is that when thinking about difficult conversations, it's incredibly important to think about what is not said. What is not said is often the key to understanding why the conversation is hard. Um, and when you analyze these difficult conversations, there's often three simultaneous conversations happening at once. The first is the conversation about what happened, or what people think happened, or what should have happened. 
This often plays out as a conversation about facts. You should have done this. You failed to do this. Who's at fault? You, you hurt me. You did the wrong thing. To the degree we have the conversations, that's usually where it ends. But in fact, there's also a second conversation going on that often doesn't get addressed. And that's that there's a whole bunch of emotions and feelings that all the parties are having, but they don't talk about it explicitly. They don't know how to do it. They're afraid to do it. But there's a conversation there. And then there's a third, even deeper level, which is that these conversations often implicate our own self-identity. The story that we tell us about ourselves, I'm a competent person, I'm a good Catholic, I'm a good parent. Um, and that identity, those identity issues can get challenged or pushed in these, conversa in, in these conversations, and it, they don't get talked about. It usually plays out entirely at the what happened level. So I want to um, spend some time talking about all three of these con uh, conversations. I'm going to spend more time on the first one. Um, and I know, I know that you come from all sort of walks of life and different ministries. I want to say that these contexts, right, occur in every single domain of our life, professionally, personally, with colleagues, with family, with clergy, with extended family. Um, they're around us all the time. I think in the church context, right, some of the examples might be, you know, uh, dealing with uh, some people who are complaining about the new Roman Missal, or um, maybe you know giving some bad news about a decision, a hard decision that you've wrestled with. Um, maybe giving your pastor some feedback about how bad the homilies are uh, in some way or another. So you could imagine what they might be, right? Um, um, all of these um, are kind of examples of what might be incredibly hard um, conversations. I'm sure you can make your own list. Um, <laughs> if we had, I, I think I only have an hour and 15 minutes in, in our, in a, when, when we do this, I just focus on the what happened conversation for about an hour and a half. And we actually take a few students' difficult conversations and try to model them in front of the room. Um, we don't have time for that, so you're kind of saved on that score. Um, so I want to start with the what happened conversation. And I want to suggest that, um, our task in the what happened conversation to make it more effective is to make kind of three shifts. Oftentimes, the way we have these conversations is we talk about the truth. Here is what happened. Um, let me tell you and explain to you so you get it. Um, and then we often talk about um, things that happen as if the other side intended it. So we assume intentions. And we look to the past to figure out who's to blame. And the three shifts I want to talk about to make these conversations uh, more genuine and perhaps have more of a learning stance is that instead of talking about truth, we talk about perceptions, how each party experienced or saw what happened. And instead of making assumptions about others' intentions, we learn to talk about the impact of behavior on us without making the attribution of intentionality. And third, instead of looking backward to figure out who to blame, we kind of look backward jointly to figure out how did we get here so we could find a different way of moving forward. Um, I'm going to start with this first shift, um, which is truth to perceptions. Um, and I want us to do a little exercise. Now, for this exercise, you need to be able to actually see one of these two screens. So if you can't, you're going to need to get up. Um, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you, everybody, to just Put one hand up in the air and keep that hand up in the air now. Okay? And I'm going to ask you to count the number of times you see the letter F, as in Frank, on screen. Just count the number of times you see the letter F, as in Frank, on the screen. When you are 90% sure you're correct, just put your hand down and write down the number that you see. Another second or two here. Okay. 
Good. So, let me ask, how many of you saw a total of 10 Fs? 10 Fs, raise your hand. Okay, oh, a decent number of you, okay. Did anyone see fewer than 10 Fs? Oh, a few people saw, okay, so how many saw, sorry, nine. Nine. Did anyone see fewer than nine? No, how many did you see? Eight. Anyone see fewer than eight? No, okay. So, okay, we have eight, nine, ten. How many of you saw a total of 11 Fs? Okay, is the number 11? Good, okay. How many of you saw a total of 12? 12 Fs. Okay, oh, okay. How many of you saw a total of 13? 13 Fs. Oh, fewer people on 13. Okay. How many of you saw a total of 14? 14. Wow, okay, so 14. Okay, how many saw a total of 15? 15 Fs. Okay, well, how could this be? Okay. How many of you saw a total of 16? 16? No. <laughs> okay, what about 17? 17? Okay, a few. One, two, two. Okay. Did anyone see more than 17? No. Okay. Yes? <laughs> so let me, let me add, this is a hard question, but I'm going to ask you to just be honest. How many of you are still pretty sure you're right? <laughs> okay, at least a number of you. <laughs> Okay. Um, so let me ask, how many of you can't go on unless I tell you how many Fs are on? Okay. So it turns out that there are 16 Fs. So um, it's hard. I, because there's two screens, I don't know how to do this with a pointer. I'll, I'll have to have to pick one. Um, but for you people here, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 15. Oh, and so, what did I miss this one? 16. Sorry, I missed one myself. And they're in red. Um, so, okay, why do I do this? So people kind of count. Here, so I'll try to do it right here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. So, why... <laughs> So why do I do this exercise? Um, this was a, an exercise where I asked all of you to do something at the same time that was kind of objectively verifiable, right? Counting the letter F, right? <laughs> like Sesame Street, right? I asked you for 90% certainty. And it turns out mostly everybody was wrong. And yet, when we go into our most difficult conversations, it's hardly ever the case that what we're talking about is objectively verifiable, and everybody involved was there at the same time for everything, and everybody has every single shared piece of data. And yet, we often go into the difficult conversation with the idea of, I'm right, and you're wrong, and my job is to show you why. <laughs> and that approach to a difficult conversation is incredibly perilous. It gets us into a lot of trouble. Because, in fact, we all suffer from partisan perceptions for very reasonable re uh, reasons, right? And in real life, most of the time, we don't have access to all of the same data. Some of the data that is available, it's shared, but some is different. So at the end of the day, if I go around and ask all of you, you know, was this a good conference? You may say yes, you may say no. The one thing I know for certain is that it's not based on all the same data. Because you're all here now, but some of you are in different workshops during the day. And then some of you have different conversations with different people. It would be hard for me to know on what it is you're kind of making your conclusion. Some of the data is shared today, and some of the data is different. So that's one major reason why, um, why we have these perceptions. I want to talk about a few other reasons. Um, but before I do that, I want to do another exercise. So this is a, an exercise to um, give all of, you a, all of you counters a second chance, OK? <laughs> uh, uh, in this, here's what we're going to do. Um, in a moment, you're going to see a video. And in this video, you're going to see people in black shirts and people in white shirts passing a basketball to each other. 
I want you to count the number of times the people in white shirts pass the basketball to each other. If you've done this exercise before, just for the benefit of the others, I'm going to ask you to not participate. Um, so you're just going to be counting the number of times people in white shirts are passing the basketball to each other. And now we're going to have a test of my uh, AV abilities here. So give me a moment. Um, we'll do this. OK. We're going to make this lower so you can see better. Um, OK. Maybe lo sh should I make it even lower? Yes. OK. Now, now it's as low as it can go. <laughs> Okay, are you ready? Okay. Okay, one. Okay, how many? Okay. So, I know that's hard, very hard. Uh, any guesses? 10, you saw five, four, two. All right. Six. Anyone want to say 11? <laughs> OK, 11. The answer is 11, <laughs> it turns out. Let me ask this. Did anybody see anything else kind of surprising on this video? And raise your hand. Anything else surprising? What did you see? You saw a woman with a parasol walk through. Did anybody else? Well, yeah, yeah. So there are two overlaying images, and then you saw one with a parasol. Did anyone else see one with a parasol? One, two, three, four. Okay, a few other people. Did anybody see in the middle of this video um, someone uh, in a gorilla suit come and go like that? Okay, that's good because there was no such thing. <laughs> <So. laughs> That, that happens to be the more popular of these videos. And uh, I guess it was three years ago. Was it three years ago, Flory? So I have a colleague who teaches with me sitting here. Um, in my class, I did this. And I said, did anyone see anything surprising? And some kid raised his hand. He said, yeah, there was a, someone in a gorilla suit in the middle of the thing. I think, like, no, there wasn't. <laughs> You've seen another video, but there wasn't here. But actually, it is the case that in the middle of this video, a woman with a parasol just walks right through the center of the video. Do you guys want to see the video again? Yeah. OK. This time, this time I just want you to look for the woman who will walk through. She has a parasol. She'll walk right through the center, OK? Um. OK, here we go. OK, one. Yes, she is. Okay. How many? Okay. So why why am I showing you all these crazy things? Here's another reason. Here's another cause of partisan perceptions. It turns out that we sometimes. We have access to the same data in a room, but we pay attention to different data. I asked you to do a really specific task, right? Count the number of times the basketball is going between people with the white shirt. So you're highlighted to that. And because you're highlighted to that, you don't notice something else that is quite surprising happening. And just the way human beings are, it's impossible for us to observe everything that's happening in a room at the same time. So we tend to be selective. And we're not selective in evil or bad ways, but we are selective in ways that confirm our existing perceptions, that reinforce the story that we already have. And we tend to not see or dismiss the disconfirming data. On the very first day of class in a, you know, a law school that's filled with 20-somethings, it's really interesting because you can see students they're looking around, and they're kind of looking to see who's attractive, and then they very quickly look down to see, does the person have a ring? Right? The single students are doing this. The married students, hopefully at least, aren't. Right? That's just not that important to them. 
you know, if you're interested in kind of fashion and style, you kind of notice like, oh, Bordeaux's not much of a dresser. If you don't care about that, you just don't notice. So one reason why we have partisan perceptions, right, is we don't even have access to the same data. But sometimes we have access to the same data, but we're not noticing it. We're picking up on the data that we want to. There's another reason why um, we sometimes, partisan perceptions happen. Um, and uh, to kind of talk a bit about it, I'm going to show you a movie clip. So I like to teach using movie clips. Um, I'm going to show you a clip from a movie called Notting Hill. You don't need to know that much about this film, but just to kind of put it in a little bit of context, Julia Roberts plays a movie star, like she is, but she plays a movie star, who is kind of tired of the po uh, paparazzi following her around. So she, she leaves, she goes to the Notting Hill area of London, she meets Hugh Grant, who runs a small little bookstore, uh, leads a simple life. She ends up spending a night with him, and the next morning, it turns out that the paparazzi is standing outside of Hugh Grant's house. And in this clip, Julia Roberts is incredibly mad. Uh, so I'm going to show you this clip, which demonstrates another, uh, another reason for partisan perceptions. OK, let's see this and this. This. Or a holiday, depending who's got the brains to get the going rate right on the trail. That is not true. Wait a minute. This is crazy behavior. Hey, can't we just laugh about all this? Seriously, in the huge sweep of things, this stuff doesn't matter. What he's going to say next is there's people starving in the Sudan. Well, there are, and, and we don't have to go anywhere near that far. My best friend slipped. She slipped downstairs, cracked her back, and she's in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Or, you know, all I'm asking for is a normal amount of perspective. You're right. Of course, you're right. It's just that I've dealt with this garbage for 10 years. You've had it for 10 minutes. Our perspectives are very different. I mean, today's newspapers will be lining tomorrow's waste paper bit. Excuse me? Well, you know, it's just one day. Tomorrow, today's papers will all have been thrown out. You really don't get it. This story will be filed. Every time anyone writes anything about me, they'll dig up these photos. Newspapers last forever. I'll regret this forever. Right. Right. I will feel the opposite. If that's okay by you. And, uh, I'll always be glad that you came to stay. But um, you're probably right. Okay, sorry, I know you prefer to continue with that. <laughs> 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 We're not going to do that. <laughs> so, uh, so what's the other reason? Right? Here's a situation where they actually have shared data and they both observe the same data, but they interpret that data differently. And this is another reason for partisan perceptions, is we tend to interpret data based on our past histories, based on our past experiences. For Julia Roberts, this is kind of a disaster. For Hugh Grant, it's like, I was gonna even be thinking about this tomorrow. Um, and one of the things to remember when you go into a difficult conversation, um, and I'm sure all of you are very keenly aware of this, right? It's, you're not just negotiating with that person's negotiation or difficult conversation present, but you're talking with them about their entire past. And if you're certainly representing the Catholic Church, it's their history of experience with the church, but it's also their history of experience with you um, and any institution that you happen to be representing. And they're gonna be constructing stories with heroes and villains and good guys and bad guys. And then the last thing that makes it incredibly hard is that often what happens is group dynamics that reinforce our perceptions. So the Republicans get together with the Republicans and they watch Fox News, right? And they demonize the Democrats. And the Democrats get together and they watch Rachel Maddow, right? And they demonize the Republicans. So this is pretty complex stuff, all at the what happened level. Um, and one tool, um, oh yeah, here, this is no, this is another fun little, this is an example of this. So this is a, a headline that comes out in a newspaper 
one morning. And the headline is as follows. It says, well, overbearing Forest residents terrorize lost girl, force her to abandon temporary shelter. So the same day, uh, another newspaper has this headline. The headline is, juvenile delinquent breaks into absent family's home, steals food, wantonly destroys furniture. Does anybody know what story this is? Yeah, right? It's Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Somebody, <laughs> right? The first, the first headline is obviously from the human beings paper, right? And the second headline is from the bears paper. Now, somebody said that this is the story of Little Red Riding Hood, but that's the story about a wolf, I think. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, a tool that can help when you go into these conversations is what we call the ladder of inference. Oftentimes, when we have these conversations, we're talking at what we would say the top of the ladder, a conclusion. You're right, you're wrong, you meant to do this, you didn't mean to do it. And it's much more helpful to actually, not you do want to share your conclusion, but what is the data? What did I see or observe at a specific level? What is my reasoning process? And then here's my conclusion. Because oftentimes people have different ladders. So they're select, first of all, they have access to different data, right? Then they're selecting differently. They're selecting based on their assumptions and their biases. Then they're interpreting based on their past stories. And then they're coming to different conclusions. So going into these conversations with a different set of assumptions, the common set of assumptions is, um, I see things as they are. I'm fair and objective. And people genuinely they believe this. They're not, they're not trying to be manipulative. So there's, you know, survey research asking spouses, you know, what percentage of the household chores do they do? And the average typically is about 123% if you add them up, <laughs> right? It can't be that way. Or there's uh, Max Benjamin, one of our colleagues, has done really interesting research um, on what's called a baseball or final offer arbitration. So the way this kind of arbitration works is both sides submit a final offer to the arbitrator. And the arbitrator has to pick one of the two offers. Can't split the difference, can't do another number, has to pick one of the two. And the idea is this will incentivize both sides to submit the most fair thing, right? Because they want theirs to be chosen. So when parties are asked, you know, what is the likelihood that your offer will be chosen? What's the right answer? 50%. Right? I mean, the right answer is 50%. And yet the average is 68%, right? <laughs> they say it's 68%. So, so, I mean, these are not people who are being bad, right? We just tend to think of ourselves as more fair, more objective, um, than the average person, right? And, but these assumptions kind of get us in trouble. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, and so a much better set of assumptions is just to realize that partisan perceptions exist. Um, realizing the reasons for it. Therefore, I need to approach this conversation with an openness to learning, with an openness to at least trying to perspective take and see how do they see the world. So I want to be clear, this is not a necessarily a style. A, uh, yeah, not necessarily a style. It's more of a stance. I want to enter a difficult conversation being aware of partisan perceptions. I want to be prepared to walk the other side down the ladder of inference, to really hear what they have to say. I, I want to be able to share my perspective too, but not just the conclusion. I kind of want to be able to share the data with them and the reasoning, and then frame the situation as a joint problem. Sometimes people um, will kind of charge us with being soft and touchy-feely. Um, that's not what we mean here. This can be done in a soft, touchy-feely style. It could also be done in a harder style. Um, but the stance, the openness, is what matters. Um, I want to show um, another clip that I think demonstrates this, at least to me, very powerfully. It's from a movie uh, called Dead Man Walking. Uh, probably many of you have seen it. Um, in this particular clip, if you haven't seen the movie, just to um, tell you a bit about it, um, Susan Sarandon is playing Sister Helen Prejean, who um, is visiting a, uh, a murderer or alleged murderer on death row, um, played by Sean Penn. Uh, in the movie, um, Sean Penn's character has 
I would say, almost no redeeming qualities. Um, and certainly in this clip, he says some very offensive, uh, upsetting things. I know if I heard someone say this, I'd, I would kind of not react well. Um, and I think what's so interesting to me is um, how beautifully in this clip, Sister Helen Pujan does these things, even though her style isn't exactly kind of touchy-feely. So let's just take a look at this, um, and then we'll kind of press forward. Huh. I ain't looking for no loophole. Rain, rain, rain. That's a bad sign. They already executed one black to buy us. Waiting for sale tonight. That's two blacks. Time for a white. Governor under pressure to get a white. And that's me. Nigga on the gunning before me. I should hope they clean that thing before they put me on it. Is your daddy a racist? What kind of question is that? We have to teach a child to hate, and I was just wondering who I taught just you. don't like niggas. Have you ever known any black people? Sure, I did. That's all around when I was a kid. All around? They lived around me. Did you ever play with a black child? No. But me and my cousin got jumped pretty good once. What happened? We were throwing rocks at him. So the next day, they wait that chance to get a hold of our bikes, tear them up. Can you blame them? Well, no, but look, slavery's long over. They always hopping on what a bad deal they got. The kids that tore up your bike? All of them. I can't stand people who make themselves out to be victims. Victims? Yeah, they all victims. I don't know any victims in my neighborhood. I know some pretty cool people, decent, hard working. Yeah, I know a lot of lazy, welfare taking colors, sucking up tax dollars. You sound like a politician. What's that mean? You ever been the object of prejudice? No. What do you suppose people think about inmates on death row? I don't know. Why don't you tell me? They're all monsters. Disposable human waste. Good for nothing, sucking up tax dollars. Yeah, but I ain't no victim. They gonna kill me, I'm innocent, I ain't whining, I ain't sitting on no porch going slavery, slavery. I like rebels, some blacks is okay. Martin Luther King, he led his people all the way to D.C., kicked the white man's butt. You respect Martin Luther King? Now, he put up a fight, he wasn't lazy. What about lazy whites? Don't like him. So it's lazy people you don't like. Can we talk about something else? <laughs> So I just love that clip, right? Because she is sharing the data that, and her reasoning and her conclusion, and she's asking him for it. Um, but you know, the style is pretty calibrated to him. Um, so I think it's for me, it's more about the stance that you approach to these conversations. Um, okay, let's move to the second kind of shift, which is on from moving from talking about intentions um, to impact and. To do this, I'm going to start with a little story. So this, this is actually a true story. Uh, one of our teaching assistants, it's now eight years ago, um, was kind of her side business was setting up her friends on dates. Um, so she sets up two of her friends. And the next day, she gets an email from both of them, uh, unsolicited. Um, and when she would read the two emails, she just thought, oh my gosh, this is perfect for Bob's class. So she got their permission to send me the email. Um, so this is excerpts of uh, this actual email, that two emails that were sent to um, our now colleague, Rachel. Um, the names of the two people have been changed. Um, so um, I think I'm going to stand over here so I can read it. So this is an email from um, Phil to Rachel. And it says, I just thought I'd drop you an email to let you know what a great time I had married Beth last night. Thanks for sending us up. I'm definitely planning on calling her again. Mary Beth to uh, uh, Rachel says, so about that date with Philip, let's just say it wasn't a dream date. Nothing venture, nothing gained, but this is all she wrote. So this continues. Phil says, really, it was very nice. Great dinner conversation, good laughs. We went to a fun restaurant. Then I took her down to this new bar I've been going to recently. The place was hopping, lively and fun. A really great time. Mary Beth continues, conversation was still today. He clearly, he was clearly trying too hard to be funny and it wasn't working. The restaurant was too unfancy, who's he going to impress that way? And then the post-dinner dive bar was too unfancy. Philip must think I'm an idiot or insane or worse. Okay, this is not going well. Here's how it ends. As luck would have it, some of my friends came into the bar after about an hour. They're great guys, but not very presentable, if you know what I mean. I sort of said hi quickly and suggested that Mary Beth and I leave. 
I figured she wouldn't have appreciated that much, and I was trying to make a good impression. Mary Beth to Rachel. So, just as I'm about to suggest that we leave this dump, some of his friends walk in. Does he introduce me? No. Does he even invite me into the conversation? No. Basically, he talks to them, then turns to me and suggests we leave. Thanks, buddy. Glad to know you think so highly of me. <laughs> so, when we see both emails, right, you kind of can get the story. Like, Phil is probably thinking, my embarrassing frat brother friends have just shown up. She thinks I hang out with people like this. Let's get out of here. And she's probably thinking, am I that unpresentable that I can't even be introduced? Now, the good news is that our colleague, Rachel, right, she was in this negotiation mediation program. She still actually works full time as a mediator. She continued to work some magic. Phil and Mary Beth actually end up dating, graduating from law school, moving to New York, getting married, moving to Greenwich, and having three kids. And every year, every year I tell this story, and I contact Rachel, so that I give this lecture in March, and I contact Rachel right before I give it to get an update on Phil and Mary Beth. Um, but here's, I, I, I feel like I have to do this, especially in the church thing. Um, I mean, I'm Catholic, I feel very guilty if I didn't tell you that last year what I called her, she said, they separated. Uh, I know. <laughs> I still think it's a good story, but, but I, I, I checked it with her this year, and she wrote, she's like, they're still separated. <laughs> Get them back together, Rachel. Uh, but anyway, the point is this, um, really not about the story, right? But we often assume the intentions of the other based on their behavior, the impact of their behavior on us. So if we're hurt or angry or frustrated, they meant to, right? Phil meant to blow me off because I felt blown off. But if we have good intentions, it's a misunderstanding, they should kind of get over it. Um, and this gets us in trouble, right? And this is a, this kind of um, dynamic has been studied enormously. It's actually called the accuser-excuser bias. Um, and here's how it, wait, it works. Um, I do something that someone else, in this case, the character is Toby, experiences as harmful. Then there's this kind of decision that has to happen. So there's this thing called an accuser bias. Because what has to happen is Toby has to decide, did Bob intend that or not? If Toby decides Bob didn't intend it, right, he might be frustrated. But he's probably not angry at me. But if he says Bob intended it, then he feels anger. And that inspires the desire to retaliate. I want to get back, right? Now, I have a decision. Did Toby intend to do that to me? And I suffer now from two things. One is called the excuser bias. Hey, I didn't mean anything. What was that about? But you meant that, right? So now I get angry and I counter-retaliate. And this ends up in a vicious conflict spiral. Um, and Keith Alred, who is a, a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School, um, he kind of argues that this accuser excuser bias is actually kind of a, a Darwinian feature. I mean, what he essentially says is, in a state of nature, if you're, you know, in the dark woods and you bang into somebody, you have to decide quickly: did they intend it or not? But if you say they intended it, you turn around, you take your club, you kill them. Right? You live, they die. If you say they didn't intend it and you're wrong. Right? They club you and you die. In terms of an error, it's better to make the error that they intended. It. From a survival perspective a long time ago, right? But most of our conversations in life and most of our interactions in the 21st century, this adaptation doesn't help us. It kind of gets us stuck. Um, but this dynamic is in play, and so the advice is, as much as you can is to enter these conversations thinking that with respect to my own actions or inactions, I can be aware of my own intentions, although often we're not even aware of our intentions. But we have some capacity to be aware of our intentions. The thing we do not know unless we ask is what impact is my action or inaction having on the other? And similarly, with respect to the action of the other, I can know with certainty what impact their behavior had on me. But I shouldn't be making an attribution of intentionality 
I d I'm unaware of what their intentions might be. And so a, a better set of assumptions than I got hurt, therefore they intended it, or so long as I had good intentions, that all, that's all that matters, is simply to be aware actions don't always meet and though there's equal intentions, often there's multiple or conflicting intentions. It doesn't take away from you feeling hurt or angry or upset. That's genuine and real. But I want to withhold the judgment of the attribution until I check in with them. And when you're kind of getting feedback that you did something wrong, it's good that you had good intentions, but it doesn't take away from the fact of what the impact might be on them. Um, this is, again, very, very hard to do. Um, a few years ago, um, there was a student in my class. So my class is about 120 people in it. And we teach in a teaching team. And there's one student I noticed every day. She would be just pounding away on her laptop. It irritated me. Day in and day out, it would irritate me. And then there was one day where my colleague Jillian was up giving a lecture. And she was actually telling a story about her dog. It was an interesting story, but not quite worth taking notes on it. <laughs> And this woman was typing away. Um, uh, most of the time, I should say, I'm incredibly bad at everything I'm talking about. Um, for some reason, I kind of remembered this stuff. And I went up to her afterwards, and I just said, you know, gosh, I noticed when Jillian was telling the story, you were, you know, you seemed to be taking some notes. And I was curious, you know, what you found interesting about it. I mean, I thought it was funny. I was kind of surprised. And she said, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, I actually have attention deficit disorder, and the way that I keep focus is by taking verbatim notes of everything in the class. And I said, oh, wow, you know, thanks for telling me. Um, and it's interesting, at the end of the semester, she emailed me a transcript of the class. This is word for word, everything that happened in that class. Um, and I was really grateful that I didn't just go in and say, if you don't put that computer away, it's going to be my Frisbee. Uh, right, <laughs> which is what I wanted to say. Um, and so it just really reminded me, you know, sometimes you think you know what's going on, you think that they're kind of being disrespectful of you, and there's something else happening. Um, but so hard to do, right, in the real world, so hard to do. Um, and, you know, my colleague Flory here knows <laughs> that I mostly miss. Um, but uh, um, so the last shift, right, is moving from blame to joint contribution. How are we doing the time? Okay, good. Um, so um, often when something goes wrong, there is a call to look back to figure out who's at fault so we can punish them. Right? This is kind of a, a typical kind of human instinct. And there are definitely domains and times and places where punishment is appropriate. Um, for most of the kinds of difficult conversations where there are relationships, repeat interaction, people we care about, this doesn't usually help so much. It doesn't mean we shouldn't look backward, but we should look backward and figure out what are the ways in which we each contributed so that we can find a way to improve together going forward. If I set it up as an investigation where someone is going to be blamed in the end, this does not help us get at what happened. This just has people kind of avoid as best they can. And one of the things just to be aware of with respect to yourself and others is sometimes people have tendencies one way or the other. So some of us um, tend to be more contribution shifters. Something bad happened, right, and it has nothing to do with me. It's everybody else's fault. Some of us are contribution absorbers. If something happens, it's my fault. And just one thing is to try to balance your own tendency. Almost all the time, there's a way in which we may have contributed, and they may have contributed. Um, so to be aware of that the common assumptions of there's this thing called fault, and one of us is going to get stuck with it at the end. Um, and if I accept responsibility, it means I'm weak usually doesn't help us in a difficult conversation. It's much more helpful to be aware of the fact that we may each have contributed. And when I accept responsibility for my part, that's the thing I can change. And I can't change them, but I can change that. Um, a few years ago, um, when I was teaching in our executive education program, a, uh, a, a federal judge, who is this kind of big, booming guy, 
took our course. And in our course, we do um, kind of a unit where we work very intensively in a small group where, uh, and have people to kind of pick an interpersonal skill they want to work on in a real life context that matters to them. So people pick all kinds of things. This big booming judge who the whole week, I think the whole class is kind of intimidated by, um, his, his thing he wanted to work on was he had been married for about 38 years. And apparently every morning, his wife would pick out his tie for him. <laughs> and he hated it. He like, did not like the ties, and he did not like her picking them out. And the thing he wanted to practice was asking her not to do that. Um, and it was really hard to get him to do it. And finally, what it really took is for him to, in the conversation, you know, he kept on saying, well, I can't do it because it's been 38 years. <laughs> and just for him to be able to say, like, your contribution was you never said anything. Like, you contributed just because you never said anything. And just say that. She couldn't have read your mind. And you can apologize for that. Uh, and that seemed to open up this space for him. Um, but it was kind of funny sitting, I mean, this is, you know, a few years ago, I'm thinking, you know, I'm 30 years old, he's a big federal judge, and he's stuck on this. <laughs> but, but, it, but, it, but, you, but the kind of power of the emotion and the power of kind of figuring out, yeah, this was my contribution, and I can own that and say it transparently, um, was really actually kind of touching and powerful. So with respect to the what happened conversation, right, to work as hard as you can to understand that, which doesn't mean giving up your view. It means being open, doesn't mean giving up your view. To then express yourself to your satisfaction, sharing the data and the reasoning, and then the frame whatever context as a joint problem. Now we still have two more conversations, right? The second is this feelings or emotions conversation, which is incredibly hard, right? Because I think most of us, and maybe, you know, this may be one of the many ways, I guess, in which maybe all of you differ from kind of the law context, right? In the law context, logic rules the day, right? Um, Who's right? What's wrong? What's the solution? Let's problem solve. Boom, 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 boom. And there's this thing, this feelings thing is like, what is this, right? This is a big problem that we just need to get rid of, right? Why am I having these feelings? Um, but in fact, right, um, what we think influences our emotions, right? And how we feel influences the kinds of things we think about. And both the kind of rational and the logic and the emotions help us in decision making. So we don't want to have the emotions sweep us over and make us unable to make the decisions, but we don't just want to cast out the feelings. Because the feelings are helpful. They help us make really good decisions. And these notions somehow that we ought to check our feelings at the door. Um, and that as, so long as we don't show our emotions, no one will notice. Right? <laughs> Isn't true, right? It is the true. I mean, I'm glad you're laughing. I think, you know, this is what's different about law, law students think like, oh yeah, like I could just kind of show I'm okay with it. And it's leaking out all over the place, you know? I mean, you know, I mean, one of the things I say is like, I've never seen a workplace where there's a sign on the way in that says, please deposit your feelings here for pickup at the end of the day, right? And you kind of put them in, you have no feelings, and you come up and you bring them home and share them with your friends and family. Like, no, like, it, you know, it doesn't work like that. Um, so feelings are really always present, and unexpressed emotion is going to affect relationships. So if we're not skillful about being self-aware, if we're not skillful about how people often deal with feelings, it's going to get us into trouble, because oftentimes people make translations with their emotions. So something comes across as a judgment or an a, a characterization, or an accusation, or blame, or even problem solving, right? Here's what you need to do. But that's masking. It's masking, usually, some kind of feeling or emotion. Um, some years ago, um, there had been a number of uh, pretty serious racial incidents in the first year class at Harvard Law School. And the next year, I had worked pretty hard to persuade the administration to bring in my colleagues, Sheila and Doug, the ones who wrote Typical Conversations, to come do a, a training for the whole first year class. And they did that in the fall term. And, uh, and I had said to them, 
you know, I'd be really grateful. I can't do all these trainings because I'm actually working here doing other teaching. But I'd be really grateful to be involved in any way that I can. Um, and they said, sure, sure, you know, no worries. Then in the spring term, when I was teaching, I get a phone call from Doug. And he says, oh, hey, Bob, I wanted to let you know they hired us to give one more session, just an open session for anyone in the law school. Can you just make an announcement um, at the end of your class telling people to come? And I said, uh, no, I don't do announcements in my class. What do you think I was feeling? Yeah, left out, right? Like, I felt left out. I felt excluded. I felt used. Um, and I mean, I guess I felt, I mean, I also feel ashamed that I had that reaction. Um, about like an hour and a half later, I kind of sat with it and I said, I mean, I make all sorts of announcements in my class, right? <laughs> but I realized actually what I felt was I felt excluded and left out. And so I called Doug up and I said, you know, I'm sorry that happened. Here's how I actually felt. And I wanted to let you know. And of course, I'm happy to make the announcement. I think this is good stuff. I'd love everyone to come. But, um, but it's, it, it's just so interesting how quickly kind of we have this emotion and we shift to something, either our power or um, maybe becoming a victim in some way. I mean, we all have different ways in which we shift, right? But to be aware of that in ourselves and also in the other, and it's really challenging when it's happening in the other because you have to retranslate back. Do you have a question? Well, luckily, Doug, since he did write this book and, um, and was, I think, the way I approached it, I think he was actually incredibly apologetic. And he said, we should have talked, and we just didn't think of it. Um, in fact, you know, talking about intentionality, like there was no intentionality. I mean, so it wasn't that they had good or bad intentions, they just literally didn't remember. Um, you know, and Doug and I are still colleagues, you know. Um, the other thing to pay attention to is many times someone will be telling you something in a conversation. And you notice um, that there's a lot of emotion there. And again, this may, this may differ from this group than for groups I often work with. Groups I often work with kind of see a problem and they sense some strong feeling. So they do this. They problem solve, right? Except for the, you know, the, the challenge here is that's not what's needed yet. First, what's needed is some kind of acknowledgement. It doesn't mean we don't need problem solving, but we need to feel hurt. Um, I, uh, I don't do this so much anymore. Um, uh, but one of the things I used to do, so I tend to get overcommitted. And then I'm working really hard. I still do that. Um, but I would sometimes call my mom and I would say, oh, Gosh, I'm so exhausted. I'm giving a talk on Saturday. I have a workshop on Sunday. On you know Monday, I have a TGT meeting at eight, and then I have this thing Tuesday night. And she'll say, "Well, you know, you need to learn to tell people no. You need to take a break. You need to calm down." And I'm so angry when she's done with that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the advice, very good advice. Yes, I should do that. But what I really want her to do first is just to say, "You sound exhausted." Yeah, I'm really exhausted. You know, well, what do you think you should do about that? Right now, I'm ready for that. Um, but we miss that piece a lot of the time. We just miss that piece. So um, let's see, how are we doing on time? Um, I think I'm going to skip this. Did I do this exercise? I, th um, I think I'm going to skip this exercise. Um, oh, people are really upset. OK, we'll do this fast. Here's what I want you to do. We'll do it in five minutes, and we'll skip something else. Uh, uh, okay, here's what I want you to do. Just on a piece of paper, I just want you on the left-hand column to mark easy, and on the right-hand column to mark hard. You're not handing this in or anything. Um, and I want you to just jot down what are the motions that are easy for you to express on the left-hand side, and what are the ones that are hard for you to express? To help you with emotions, um, here is a list. Uh, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Uh, you laugh, the law students need this list. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to give you maybe two minutes to just jot them and put them in the right column.
Okay, so why don't I, one could go on for this, but here's what I want you to do. I'm just going to give you 120 seconds, two minutes, just with a partner or one or two people around you, just compare your list. Just compare your list. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think I need to ask people to stop. Okay. So, I'm really sorry to truncate this. Maybe you're not. <laughs> uh, so let me just really quickly ask, any surprises or observations that someone want to share? Yes. Yeah. 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 So the context of the relationship really matter. Yeah. Some others. Yes. All right. Don't no, no, go. Then we'll get. Yeah. So the history and experience really matter as well. Hmm. Yeah, oh, interesting. So the hard things are, we're not kind of joyful into doing. Yeah. One or two other surprises. Yeah. Yeah, so the ones that are hard go against the self perception. Yeah, this is not me. Yeah, good. One more. Yeah. Slide over a little bit more versus you know telling somebody I'm feeling sad and his response to me is growing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Off, often how, um, and this is one of the reasons we're doing this. We each have like this unique emotional footprint. So some people say, "Oh, I'm not. I don't do emotions. <laughs> I'm not good at." And you know, actually. It's usually the case, there's some that we're good at and we do, and there's some that aren't. And for some people, it's really easy to express happy emotions or positive ones, and some, they're not so good at that. Um, they're, they're better at expressing the others. And so we can have these interactions in our difficult conversations where we're making assumptions. Um, the very first time I was a teaching assistant, I was working for one of the co-authors of this book. The book didn't exist yet. Um, Sheila Heen. And um, it, was, it was a really hard, I mean, I loved it. She's a, she's a master teacher and a great mentor. But I was struggled the whole semester at how I was doing. I thought, in fact, I thought I was doing really poorly. Um, and then in a lecture she gave, she just 
kind of off the cuff mentioned how it's really hard for her to express appreciation. And I thought, oh, right? And appreciation is really easy for me. Um, I need a lot of it, but I also give a lot. I, I like to give a lot. It's just something I do. Um, and I realized we had just this interaction that was kind of making me feel like I was doing a bad job. Um, and I see that come up so often, you know, now that I teach and work in this stuff, where you just have two people who are kind of caught, someone who needs appreciation and doesn't, isn't good at it. It's not that they're being stingy, they're just not good at it in some way. And someone who knows how to express love and someone who can't really receive it. Because I only ask the question express. Right? If I ask, how do you do this? If you had more time, right? What is easy for you to receive and hard for you to receive? That list may or may not map in the same way. So the point, right, is we each have these unique emotional footprints. They're in place during these conversations. Some of you, some of you here may be a therapist, right? But some of you might be saying, you know, this is good enough, but what does this have to do? We have things to get done every day. Um, and I think the thing I want to say here is, I'm not necessarily suggesting you should be talking about your feelings all day, um, but sometimes talking about the feelings is what you need to do to be able to move on. And otherwise, you'll be stuck. So when you're thinking about others' emotions, right, active listening, trying to retranslate their judgments back into feelings. Um, something that may be helpful, and this is in another book that um, is not out there, but I would recommend for those of you who are interested in this topic, it's called Beyond Reason, um, how to uh, think about emotions when negotiating. Um, but there are kind of five major emotional core concerns that most of us have. We want to be appreciated. We want to feel affiliated. We want to feel part of instead of excluded. We want to feel that we have freedom to make choices that we're not just being imposed upon. We want to have autonomy. In any relationship, we want to have some status, some, some uh, value. We want to be given a good role. Um, when these kind of five um, uh, concerns aren't met, it often spurs us to have negative emotions. And when we can meet these, it usually elicits more positive and helpful ones. So whenever I kind of see negative emotions, what I try to do is think about which of these is not being met right now. And even in myself, when I'm kind of feeling bad, I think, like, what is missing for me? And it almost always will track onto one of these five um, in some way or another. OK, I'm pretty much out of time. Um, so um, let me just quickly say something about um, uh, the identity conversation. This is a fun cartoon. So the identity conversation um, in my last um, few minutes here. Um, what we mean by it, right, is um, our sense of identity comes from our past experience, comes from implicit rules that we have about the world and how it should work. And there's a story we tell about who we are. Um, and often, in a really difficult conversation, what's happening is there's something about our identity that's getting triggered. We're receiving some kind of information that suggests you did treat someone unfairly. You did fail here. You, you were irresponsible. You, you know, are a lousy Catholic. Um, and we get triggered and we kind of fall into, um, we're not going to do this exercise, we kind of fall into one of two responses, right? Sometimes this is an identity quake, so we defend. No, that didn't happen. No, you're wrong, right? But other times, the opposite happens, right? We get a piece of information, and we let it kind of blow up our identity. You're right, I am worthless. I am a failure. Um, and our advice here, as much as possible, is to simply complexify your own sense of identity. Even if I am generally a loyal friend, sometimes I will probably do some things that are disloyal. Um, um, and in the negotiation, having kind of a better uh, sense of the range of different identities that I have, how complex that they are, and that the other has, and doing whatever I can to kind of elicit a more helpful identity, right? I could either make you be bad guy or helper. Um, someone who can kind of educate me and show me something I don't know, 
or somebody who's wrong and inadequate. I mean, I want as much as I can to try to elicit those positive identities. Um, one of my identities about myself, um, which Flory knows very well, is that I never, ever go over. So <laughs> it is 2 o'clock. Um, I, I have sometimes gone over, but I'm not going to do it this time. Uh, I'm happy to stay around. Uh, thank you for laughing at my kind of not-so-great jokes. I hope some of this was helpful. Thanks for having me.